Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Uh, today we'll read from a book titled Display, edited by George Nelson and published by Whitney Publications in 1953. The word display comes from a Latin root which means to unfold or to spread out. As used by us in a variety of situations, it always conveys the idea of calling someone's attention to something by showing it in a conspicuous way. While the material presented in this book is special in its application and contemporary in its outlook, it relates nonetheless to an ancient and widely practiced art, one which in a sense even antedates the human race. The plumage of a male bird and the antics of a fighting fish are display. So are the illuminated letters in a medieval manuscript. The purposes of display are many, although the essential procedures always involve attracting attention. The object of display may be to attract a member of the opposite sex, to establish identity, as in the heraldic symbols blossomed on the shields of the knights, or the markings of the undersides of planes to indicate social position, whether actual or desired, by means of school ties, crowns and tiaras, the amount of land around the house, the uplift of the rare fenders of the Cadillac, to convey information, as in road signs, traveling exhibits, posters, billboards, and to attract customers. The great bulk of display in this unromantic age of ours is designed to persuade someone to buy something he may or may not need or want. In a curious esoteric book by Maurice Collis, The Land of the Great Image, the author devotes his considerable talents to descriptions of some forgotten people who lived in unfamiliar places. The time is the 17th century, and much of the narrative deals with the strange and bloody Portuguese town of Goa, halfway up the west coast of India. Goa was a beachhead in the church's fight to extend its influence into Asia, and its decadent society was ruled by the Inquisition. Hence, going to church was an important activity. This is how an upper-class lady, superbly attired in the Portuguese mode, went to church. Her gown is gold brocade, which glows under a mantle of black silk gauze. She comes riding in a palanquin, seated on a Persian carpet and propped on velvet cushions. On foot behind are a score of maid servants, slave girls from Middle or Upper India, or Negroes from Mozambique, bought for their looks and dressed to set them off in colored smokes falling to the navel and white pleated scarlet petticoats, some carrying a mat, a carpet, a prayer book, others a handkerchief or a fan, and so on. Despite the remoteness of the time, the obscurity of the place and the almost total incomprehensibility of the society, we have no difficulty in identifying this performance as the kind of display it was. The tradition persists and its innumerable expressions can be understood. The reason for this rather devious introduction to an introduction is that in the book at hand the customary tight lines around the various kinds of display have been somewhat relaxed, and the idea is giving a broader meaning than is customary. To some groups of designers and commercial artists, display is window display. In other circles, it means the moving advertising devices one sees in store windows and railroad waiting rooms. Here, it has been taken to cover virtually every three-dimensional design activity in which the main purpose is to show something. Thus, since shops must show their merchandise in order to sell it, examples of shop design are included. Showrooms are in the same category, although here the public may be a very limited group. Exhibitions, whether world's fairs or small portable shows, have been considered eligible, and they are not segregated according to their purpose. 
to the designer concerned with the tools and techniques of this trade, it is not of consequence whether a given example has a commercial or educational intent. What counts is the force and clarity with which a communication is established. Modern work in the many fields of display has a value which goes well beyond its immediate surface meaning. By this I mean that if you are professionally interested in such design activities as shops and exhibitions, this collection of examples, like any other, may be valuable. But if you are not, the value may be even greater. The reason for this apparent paradox lies in the very nature of display. It is temporary. The parade of the Goanese lady and her slaves, the pretty hats in the window, the lacy exhibition building at the great fairs, all these are designed to be viewed for a limited time. Occasionally, someone miscalculates, as in the case of the Eiffel Tower, erected to serve for a summer at an exposition of 8089 and subsequently adopted as the symbol of a city. The fleeting nature of design for display has an extraordinary effect on the architect and designer. Here, he realizes he can do his work without the fear that posterity may mock him for his inaptness, and thus, freed from the censure of generations unborn, he can take a chance, try something out, and in a word, relax. It is in the relatively relaxed attitude engendered by problems of this kind that one finds the key to so much of its freshness and casual charm, and also to its remarkable prophetic nature. It is an odd thing, but true, that when one begins to trace developments in architecture, structure, interior design and related areas, the old expositions turn out to be remarkably accurate guides to future ways of doing things. Paxton's Crystal Palace, built in 1851, was a prefabricated structure entirely done in metal and glass, and its implications are not fully exhausted a century later. The Hall of Machines, put up for a Paris fair in 1889, set the pace for an entire category of steel structure. Miss van der Rohe became internationally known as an architect with something important to say throughout two exhibitions, one in 1929, the other in 1931. In this book you will find a section labeled Systems and in it have been assembled a considerable number of structures useful for the requirements of interior display. Virtually without exception, these systems build themselves into open cages of steel, wood or aluminium. The advantages of the cages, according to their designers, lies in the flexibility they permit. One can put things in them or on them. Open spaces can be filled with solid panels, if desired, flooded with light from attached lamps, etc. If these advantages really exist, is it not curious that these solutions hardly existed half a dozen years ago? Why did display structures then consist of panels which could only be assembled into walls and boxes? Obviously, the answer does not lie in the functional properties of the new cages, because these could have been established much earlier. What has happened, and this is more of the meaning below the surface mentioned above, is that there has been a change in our feelings about space and how it should be handled. It is not easy to express these feelings in permanent buildings today. There is the conservatism of owners, of building codes, of the FHA, of banks, of trade unions. But in a temporary exposition, why not? The need to be practical doesn't exist. The necessity to build inexpensively does. The designer can ease up a bit and enjoy himself. The result can be fun. It is surprising how often it is significant fun. 
Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.